the Dragon Lady. Empress Dowager Qi Shi lived an incredible life. Her first involvement in the Qing court was as a concubine, an insignificant wife to her emperor overlord. But this would not be her last appearance in the court of the dynasty, as she would rise to become the de facto ruler over the Qing dynasty for 47 years. Empress Dowager Qi Shi, the story of concubine to empress. Qi Shi was born on the 10th day of the 10th lunar month in the 15th year of the reign of the Daoguang Emperor, the 29th of November, 1835. Her father was a third class duke who worked in Beijing. In 1851, Qi Shi, out of 60 other candidates, was chosen to become a concubine to the Xianfeng Emperor. On the 26th of June, 1852, Qi Shi entered the Forbidden City but this grand palace would become a familiar environment in the future. In, 18, in 1855, Qi Shi would become pregnant, and in the following year gave birth to the crown prince Zai Shun, the Qianfeng Emperor's only son. Whilst Qi Shi was at court, she was promoted several times, and by 1857 she was considered a third-rank consort, placing her second only to the empress among the women in the emperor's harem. Qi Shi stood out from the other women in the imperial household. She could read and write Chinese, giving her many opportunities to aid the unwell emperor in running China. As a result, she became well versed in politics and the running of a nation, something which was uncommon amongst women in China. Whilst being a concubine was considered a great honour in imperial China, it was still nevertheless a greatly subordinate role. Her involvement in government was hugely revolutionary and greatly contributed to her rise later. In 1861, the Qianfeng Emperor fell into depression and finally succumbed to his ill health on the 22nd of October 1861. He ordered his eight ministers to direct and support the future emperor. The heir to the throne was Qi Shi's son and was only five years old. It is commonly assumed that the Qianfeng Emperor hoped that his wife and Qi Shi would work together and help raise the heir. This is due to the fact that he may have given them each a stamp to perform this, yet there is no evidence of this ever occurring as it is unlikely that the Emperor would have wanted or intended Qi Shi to wield real political power. It is likely that the seal was just a gift. Informal seals were common and not considered politically viable and instead small pieces of art. Upon the Qianfeng Emperor's death, his wife became the Dowager, the Empress Dowager Qian, and Qi Shi was given the title Empress Dowager Qi Shi. By the time the Emperor had died, Qi Shi had become an incredibly politically able and skilled strategist. Qi Shi conspired with court officials to seize power. Due to her position as the lower ranked Empress, she had virtually no power to wield. Furthermore, her five-year-old son, the heir to the throne, was of no political worth. She realised that it was necessary to ally with the much more powerful Empress Dowager Qian, the late Emperor's wife. The two decided that they would co-reign, with their power greater than the eight regions. The two Empresses had been close friends since Qi Shi joined the Emperor's harem. The, two, the eight regents, however, became suspicious of Qi Shi, and tensions rose between the two Empresses and the regents. Empress Dowager Qian became frustrated and refused to appear in court, leaving Qi Shi to deal with the politics herself. Behind closed doors, she had been amassing support of different ministers, soldiers and others who were enemies of the eight regents. Among this group was Prince Gong and Prince Chun, the brothers of the late Qianfeng Emperor. The late Qianfeng Emperor's funeral procession departed for Beijing and whilst this happened, Qi Shi struck. Qi Shi took the air and returned to Beijing before the rest of the party. Her early return to Beijing meant that she had more time to plan with Prince Gong and ensure that the power of the eight regents was divided. Qi Shi rewrote history, stating that the regents were dismissed for having carried out incompetent negotiations with the British, causing the Qianfeng Emperor to flee greatly against his will. Qi Shi, upon seizing power, had three of the eight ex regents executed. Prince Gong suggested that they should be executed by an incredibly painful method known as slow slicing, but she declined. She declined in order to show her high moral standards. She ordered the regent Shushun to be beheaded, 
and the two others, Zhaoyuan and Duanhua, were given pieces of silk to hang themselves. Qing imperial tradition dictated that women and princesses were forbidden from engaging in politics, but there was nothing anybody could do now. Qi Shi began a practice known as ruling from behind the curtains, and she was now the de facto ruler of China. The Qin Yao Ku was over. Qi Shi was quick to award Prince Gong, appointing him as Prince Regent. However, Qing avoided giving Prince Gong the type of political power that princes typically received. Qi Shi and Qian issued an edict on behalf of the child emperor, which stated that the two empresses were to be the sole decision makers with no interference. Qi Shi became ruler during the Taiping Rebellion, a monstrous civil war that was devastating the Qing dynasty and threatened the stability of the nation. The government was also riddled with corruption. Qi Shi took the system and decided that it needed reform, and in order to solve this, she took the role usually given to the bureaucratic affairs department. This meant that she personally had an audience of all officials above the level of provincial governor, meaning they all had to report to her personally. Qi Shi had two officials executed to scare others that dared to step out of line. She developed an official foreign ministry and also restored national armies. Qi Shi also introduced new modern railroads, factories and arsenals, a remarkably progressive set of reforms. At the Battle of Tianjin, the Taiping Rebellion was finally defeated. Qi Shi could now focus on new internal threats to her power. Prince Gong was one of, one of the many new targets to Qi Shi. His power had increased massively since his appointment, as he now had the command of many armies. He also controlled many deadly court affairs, and Qi Shi considered this a threat to her rule. A minor scribe had written a small file, accusing Prince Gong of corruption. But to Prince Gong, these accusations seemed insignificant. The Prince Regent was popular in court and had a large network of allies. For Qi Shi, this was a perfect opportunity to remove Prince Gong from court. The Prince was dismissed from his, all of his positions, and he burst into tears in front of the court and the two Empresses. Qi Shi compromised, returning him to several positions but stripping him of his title as Prince Regent. Prince Gong would never recover to his previous political position, and now Qi Shi had an iron grip over the Qing court. Despite Prince Gong being a close friend and a close ally, Qi Shi was not afraid to humiliate him and strengthen her position. Qi Shi undertook large progressive reform after the Second Opium War. It had become glaringly obvious that China was unable to face the Western empires, and as such, Qi Shi wished to learn from the Europeans and import their knowledge. However, Qi Shi's progressive ideas would soon begin to change. Members of Qi Shi's court advised her to purchase seven British warships, but Qi Shi cancelled the purchase when they were arrived and manned with British sailors. Railroads were forbidden to be constructed because she, would, she was afraid that they would disturb the emperor's tombs. When they were constructed anyway at the advice of the court, Qi Shi ordered the trains to be pulled by horses. She became alarmed at the liberal thinking of students and scholars who had spent their time abroad and believed it to be a threat to her position. In 1881, Qi Shi ended the educational policy of letting children go abroad and began to withdraw her open attitude towards foreigners, and she became increasingly xenophobic. In 1872, the Tongxi Emperor turned 17 and married the Jiashun Empress. The Jiashun Empress's father, however, was one of the regents that was banished during the coup, and tensions be between the princess and Qi Shi began to rise. Qi Shi ordered the couple to separate, and the emperor spent several months in isolation following her orders. When the Tongxi Emperor turned 18 and was given personal rule, he turned out to be completely incompetent. Despite being given a high quality education, he displayed little interest in studying. The emperor could not read in full sentences by the age of 16. The Tongxi Emperor spent many days away from court, indulging in various activities outside of the palace. Unfortunately for Prince Kong, his noble titles were stripped completely and was made a commoner. Many others were stripped of their titles and made commoners too. The Tongxi Emperor did not want to hear any criticism and even began reconstructing the summer palace in an attempt to drive Qi Shi away from the forbidden city so he could rule without interference. The chaos was too much for Qi Shi or Qian to handle, and they made a bold appearance at court. The two princesses directly criticised the emperor for his actions. Qi Shi stated that without Prince Gong, he would never have been emperor. Following this engagement, the Tongxi Emperor became incredibly ill and died from smallpox within a few weeks. His wife, the Jiashun Empress, that Qi Shi had fallen out with, 
died two months later, and in 1875, Qixi was in total control once again. The Tongxi Emperor died with no heir, so it was decided that the son of Qixi's sister was to be the new emperor. He was only four years old and his regent name was Guangxu. Qixi had the young boy completely cut off from the rest of the family and taken from his home. He was to address the emperor, Empress Qian as mother and Qixi as father. Qixi, however, fell severely ill, leaving her unable to manipulate the young emperor and the Empress Qian had to govern the nation for a while. Suddenly, in 1881, Qian, Qixi's lifelong ally and fellow empress, died. Rumours swirled that Qixi had assassinated Qian, but it was likely that she died from a sudden stroke. The Guangxu Emperor was technically allowed to be an independent ruler when he turned 16, but Qixi's position made many court officials oppose the ascension of the Emperor, instead allowing Qixi to continue her rule. Qixi passed a new document allowing her to aid the Guangxu Emperor on his rule indefinitely. In 1887, he began to rule under her supervision. On the 5th of March 1889, Qixi retired from her second regency. However, her long and active presence in the court had left many officials feeling more loyalty towards the Empress than the Emperor. If it wasn't for Qi Shi, many of the officials would never have been appointed to their positions, and as a result, her retirement left a void in the court. The Guangxu Emperor, in her absence, became incredibly liberal and wanted to reform the nation. He launched the 100 Days Reform, which aimed to make huge political and cultural changes to help modernise the empire. Qi Shi became paranoid that her power would diminish and stepped in to prevent them from dissolving her position in favour of a Western-inspired constitutional monarchy. Qi Shi told the court that the Japanese had been secretly influencing the reformist members of the court and that there was a treasonous conspiracy. This was followed by an edict that proclaimed the Guangxu Emperor as unfit to be Emperor, and his reign came to an end. The abdication of the Guangxu Emperor meant that there were slight concerns over who would be the heir. Qi Shi had a 14-year-old boy from a close branch of the family made as crown prince. She then had the Guangxu Emperor put under house arrest where he lost all of his respect and all of his privileges. Qi Shi then purged the court, executing several close mentors of the emperor and prominent reformers. In 1900, the Boxer Rebellion broke out, and Empress Dowager Qi Shi gave her support to the xenophobic anti-Christian bands of rebels. The rebels besieged the foreign legations and murdered many foreign diplomats, engineers, and merchants. Qi Shi hoped that this would help ease foreign pressure on the Qing dynasty, but it instead provoked an eight-nation alliance of European empires in Japan to invade and capture and raise many cities. Beijing was captured and the empire was humiliated once again. Following the Boxer Rebellion, Qi Shi implemented vast sweeping reforms, some of them even more radical than the ones proposed by reformers that she had actually executed. In 1908, the Guangxu Emperor died, and a day later, Qi Shi died. The emperor had been assassinated through arsenic poisoning, and many historians speculate that Qi Shi knew of her incoming death, and had the young and progressive emperor killed just so that he could not continue his reforms after her death. Qi Shi was buried in a complex of temples, covered with gold leaf and scattered with thousands of gold ornaments hanging from the ceiling. On July 1928, her tomb was raided by a warlord, and the valuables were methodically stripped. The entrance was destroyed and Qi Shi's corpse was taken from the coffin and thrown onto the ground. In 1949, the complex was restored, but she had been largely disgraced by the warlord soldiers. A large pearl that had been placed in her mouth to supposedly stop her corpse from decomposing had been stolen. This disgraceful ending for such a pious and revered ruler does not reflect her time as empress. Qi Shi ruled at a time when women were forbidden from such positions of power, but her iron grip and resolute will forced the hand of many powerful men. She controlled many emperors and against imperial Chinese customs became a popular and respected figure in the court. Empress Daoji Qi Shi, the Dragon Lady. The story of a concubine becoming the Empress of China. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Munster podcast. If you have any suggestions for any other people you would like to see next in this little biographies mini series, 
please leave it in the comments down below. There will be many more episodes like this coming out in the future. I'm quite enjoying this format. And if you have, and if you have any feedback over this episode, please let me know down, down in the comments. To support the podcast, please subscribe and like and also share. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.